My name is Kyle. Uh, if you guys don't know our team, this is our 10th lesson that we are doing to, uh, to number our days. Uh, and then we have a little tagline, a biblical approach to the end times. And we wanted to put that tagline there because to me, you know, in Psalm 90, how do we make the most of it? Knowing from the beginning to the end, uh, what does that look like? And so uh, we have a great team. David Porkadu, thanks, man. I, uh, I just, I'm just going to tell you today, I love his shirt. And I know it's Deep Ellum is what it says. If you're not from this area, it's a location near downtown Dallas. But man, as soon as I saw him today, I, the Lord just said it's a deep well. And so I just want to release that today, that what we're going to go, where we're going to go today, we're going to drink from a deep well today. That's really where it's coming. And it's going to be a lot. I, I, but I want to say it's different. I remember in seminary, uh, at, at Dallas Seminary, I, I remember they always talked about a fire hydrant. You know, you're going to try to drink from a fire hydrant. I don't think that's this today. I think this is just a lot of depth today. And I'm going to try to go slow as I can. But I just, I want you to think today, I'm drinking from a deep well today. Uh, Ray Sturdivant, a lot of you guys have asked. Ray has been an awesome, great friend uh, for quite a long time. And a lot of this actually came from Ray and I uh, sitting at a Chick-fil-A with two other buddies on a Wednesday morning, and we would talk end times. And we never agreed. We did. We, we agreed to meet at Chick-fil-A. It was really what it was. No, but we, we had great dialogues. And it came from, we were studying a book about the end times. And what Ray did, and he pushed me, and I want to honor Ray for this, is he said, don't just take for what you read at face value. Don't take what you're, you're hearing at face value. What does the word say? And then how can you back that up? That's what we want to do with this study. We're in 10 lessons. Ray's done that for us. Uh, him and his wife, Christy, are good friends of Laura and I. I just, sometimes it's just good to know who's a part of this crew and how things are wired. And, you know, like when people say, hey, I really appreciate what you guys are doing here, it's, it really is 100% a team effort. Now, just as a backdrop, last week, remember we talked about the New Covenant. The New Covenant is like a whole new language, but the reality is, is that God is saying, hey, by the way, I'm going to give you something fresh. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to fight for it. You don't have to work for it. I'm going to bless you with this new covenant from Jeremiah, right? 31, 31 through 34. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a new heart, a new perspective, and it's coming. So remember, out of this captivity language, in all of these scenarios, things aren't looking good. They're going into captivity. They are in captivity. He's giving a way bigger picture of hope. That's the language that we talked through last week. I'd highly, just so you guys know, you can always watch any of these on our YouTube channel. So if you missed last week or the last nine lessons and this is your very first time, you can catch up. Absolutely, no problem. So in today in Exodus, uh, in Exodus, in Ezekiel 36, verses 22 through 30, if you would write that down, Ezekiel 36, 22 through 30, I'm going to do a quick summary of this, but basically what you're seeing is in verse 22, God is just saying, hey, look, I'm going to reveal myself to the Israelites for my sake and my sake alone. My name is why I'm going to bring about restoration I'm going to bring about restoration to Israel because of God's name. And in fact, in verse 23, he says, I'm going to do it in such a way that the nations know who I am. I can already just tell you now prophetically, you guys, everybody sees what's going on in Israel. Everybody. Except, right, Joel, maybe the Amish. I mean, maybe. They even have that. I didn't think the point is, is that everybody's going to know God's hand is on this little place. And God says, I'm going to do this for my name's sake. And oh, by the way, in verse 24, this is a summary. I'm going to gather all of the nations. I'm bringing everybody back. And in the process, in verse 25, he says this in Ezekiel 36, 25. I will also sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. There's going to be this cleansing that takes place with Israel. That's an awesome picture. I'm gathering and you're going to see a cleansing. Now, he says this in Ezekiel 36, Kevin, if you would, just keep going. After this cleansing, I'm going to give you, he says, a new heart. I'm going to put a spirit, a new spirit within you. This is the new covenant language that we talked about last week. But this time he's saying in Ezekiel instead of in Jeremiah. So again, these major prophets that we're talking about, okay, they're releasing the same language. I'm going to give a new heart, a new spirit. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And then he says in verse 27, I'm going to put my spirit not only on you, but where? Within you. Up until this point, you guys, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would fall afresh on somebody to do a specific task. 
to blow a shofar or to walk up to a king. The spirit of God is going to come on. But now the prophet is saying, I'm going to do something new. The spirit's going to stay inside of you and not leak out. Okay, everybody with me? This is the backdrop of coming in Ezekiel 37. So last week, even though we were in Jeremiah, it's all a setup. Everything, the new covenant is going to be implemented. And then in verse 28, I love this. He says, after the spirit of God falls afresh inside of you, he says, then you will live in the land that I gave your fathers. That father's language is who, Ray? Who's that? Who's he talking about? Israel. Israel. So you've got the Abrahams, the Isaacs, the Jacobs, everybody that this language, he says, by the way, you're going to give it, you're going to live in the land that I promised to these guys. And I'm going to be your God. So again, Ezekiel 36 is new covenant language, just like Jeremiah 31, okay? I want you to see that setup as you come into Ezekiel 37. In Ezekiel 37, verse 1, this is really, I would say, aside from that text that we just read, this is probably the most well-known text in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37, even into 38, we can get into that next week, uh, is this language of, you ready? Dry bones. Okay, that's where we're going to go today, but... I'm going to already ask that the Lord gives you a whole new, fresh perspective. In verse 1, it says, The hand of the Lord was on me. Who's me? Ezekiel, right? The hand of the Lord is on Ezekiel. And then he brought me out by his spirit. And then he set him down in the middle of the valley. I love this language. It was full of bones. Now, to any Jew, you are never around bones, you guys. Like, this is like automatically like you don't leave bones out. This is a bad Jewish custom. And like God says, I'm going to put you in the middle of the worst of the worst scenarios. And I'm going to drop you here. And he says, I'm going to release something. I'm going to give you a vision over and over. I want you to see basically what the Israelites, and this is kind of a a graphic picture here, but one commentator says this represents Israelites slain during the conquest of the land and now in exile for a long time. In other words, you know what it represents? They got no hope at this point. I'm going to put you into a place where it really looks really bad. And so what happened is in this vision, he led Ezekiel all around them, these bones, and there are a great many of them on the surface of the valley, and they were very, very dry. I added a different very, sorry. It says they're very dry. And so here he is, he's being led, and as he's walking around, you have to imagine, right, just thinking, what am I doing here? So all of a sudden it says, then God said to me, son of man, Ezekiel, can these bones live? I love when God's testing us. He's asking us, hey, what do you believe? You're in a really tough spot right now. Do you think I can do something different about this? That's what he's asking. Will these bones come to life? That's what he wants to see. In any scenario, he wants to test your faith. And I love this faith component. And and you know what I love what Ezekiel said? Oh, Lord God, only you know. (laughs) Uh, You tell me. You know, that's, that's the language, right? But this is kind of the question. Now, think about this. Up until this point, okay, the Israelites were not foreign to what we would call personal uh, or individual resurrection, This is not a foreign concept to them that God can bring something back to life. So he's not introducing a new doctrine. He's not introducing a new truth to them. In fact, think about this. In 1 Kings 17, in 2 Kings 4, do you remember the widow's son? You remember the Shumanite's son? You remember both scenarios? God brings these dead kids, dead sons, back to life. Now, do I know Ezekiel was thinking about that? I don't know. But if you're in the word of God, you guys, those things, they stir in your spirit and they give you faith. And so I love his response. He said, well, only Lord God, you would know. Now, can you go to Romans 4, verse 17? I want to jump to a New Testament perspective just for all of us for a second. Romans 4, verse 17, and it will say this. It has the same feel, same underlining tones. It says, in God's sight, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He believed in God, right? We're talking about Abraham. We, he who believed in God, and what does it say? Who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. So even in the New Testament, all of us, we should have a perspective. God can do the impossible. Don't give up hope on what you see today. Don't give up hope on if you think, well, this politician's good or this one's not good. You guys, God is so much bigger than this. 
If he could take a valley of dry bones and breathe these things back to life. And so here's what God says. God says to the prophet, okay, very specifically in verse 4, Ezekiel 37, verse 4. He said to me, prophesy. In other words, I want you to release these words that are going to come to fruition. I want you to release these future tense words. Okay, this is what he's implying. Prophesy concerning these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. I don't know if you guys have ever talked to yourself before. I don't know if you've ever gone walking before, but like he's basically just saying, hey, I want these things. He's talking to these bones. And he says, he says, I want you to talk to them and say, hear the word of the Lord. I'd be like, they don't have ears. But practically, don't we do that? When you hear the word of the Lord and he's asking you to do something so radical, so drastic, don't uh, filter out faith. Because I think that's when we miss the move of God. So Ezekiel, I want you to speak to these bones. <laughs> and this is what I want you to say. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. I will cause breath to enter you and you will live. So he's going to say to a bunch of hundreds and thousands of bones and say, I'm gonna, God's going to breathe life into you and you're going to come to life. And then he says in verse 6, God is continuing to speak, right? through Ezekiel, and he's supposed to say, I'm going to put tendons on you, make flesh grow on you, and cover you with skin. And then in verse 6, he says, I will put breath in you so that you come to life. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. So in a vision, he hears from God, speak to these things. And oh, by the way, you're going to have all these kind of things. You're going to have tendons, there's going to be flesh, and there's going to be skin. In other words, I'm going to see actually something that doesn't look alive come back to life. And over and over, God says this, uh, and this is kind of a cool perspective. Uh, at this point, I probably, I'm going to draw something. Okay, Ray. <laughs> All right. You know, as image bearers of God, God, when he uh, speaks, things come into existence. And he could cause this to happen without Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. But he's actually speaking through Ezekiel, and it's why he's having him do a prophetic act of even speaking to a vision. Yeah. And through Ezekiel, there's life and death in our words, in our tongue. And he's using Ezekiel as his mouthpiece, as an image bearer of God, to speak, and a whole nation's going to get birthed again. You know, let, let's just go there. I, I love this language. Kevin, can you go to Proverbs 18, 21? This will just reiterate exactly what uh, Ray is talking about. Proverbs 18, verse 21, it talks about this spoken word. Life and death are what? In the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. So this language of speaking it in, like the scripture says, yeah, that's actually biblical. Okay, a couple other languages. Uh, go to Psalm 107, verse 20. I love this one. Psalm 107, verse 20. says, he sent his word, and what happened? He healed them. He rescued them from the pit. When that word is released, healing and life takes place. That's why it's scary when we're not becoming... Uh, biblical knowledgeable or in the word because when we don't and aren't living out the word what do we expect but death just one other context John 6 verse 63 John 6 verse 63 is another to support this language the spirit is the one who gives life now watch this the flesh doesn't help at all the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life the words of Christ are life giving. And just one more, Proverbs 10, verse 11. I don't know if you could read that or not, Kevin, but Proverbs 10, verse 11. Th this language of the mouth of the righteous is what? A fountain of life. So to raise point, when we're releasing truth, when we're releasing the word, scripture says, yes, it can bring life. So Ezekiel's surrounded by a valley of dry bones. And what is he told to do? I don't know really how to know how to draw out tendons and flesh and skin, but just know that that's what that is, okay? I actually looked all of it up, and you know, you're kind of like, yeah, that, 
they have to hear, right? So, so the next thing you know, you've got a bunch of bones, right? Those are really bad bones, but you get it. I want you to speak life into these bones so it takes form. You'll see where we're going to go with this. So he says in verse 7, what do you know? Ezekiel actually did what God told him to do. He prophesied. He released that word that he had been commanded. And while I was prophesying, there was a noise. There was a rattling sound. And the, bo the bones came together bone to bone. So the next thing you know, all of these bones, they became and took a form. Okay, they took a form, and it says this, As I looked, tendons appeared on them. In verse 8, flesh grew and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. What I'd like to propose, okay, and Ray and I and our team have sounded this out, okay, is, is one of the theories, one of the thoughts, and I think you can back this up pretty good in Scripture, is I actually believe at this point in verse 8, okay, in verse 8 of Ezekiel 37, is 1948 Israel. Okay, what do I mean by that? Okay, I'm going to give you a little history, uh, history. Okay, I'm going to read some dates. I'm not going to write them down, but I want to show you, okay? Now, it says that there was no breath in them. So right now, there's a form. There's a shell. Okay, so a couple backdrops, okay? Uh, let's just start in, in 1896. Theodore Herzl. He wrote a book, a treatise, called The Jewish State. Okay? I'm actually going to go history, history for you, just for a reason here for a second. 1897 was the opening of the first Zionist Congress in Switzerland. 1917, there was a boycott on the Jewish community of Palestine. 1946, there was a bomb on King David Hotel. Hang in here. 1947, Britain gave the UN responsibility, and yes, they called it this, Palestine. Okay, that's not my language. I'm not trying to buck any system here or anything like that, okay? So Britain gave who? UN responsibility in 47. Then what happened is in November 29th, 1947, the UN had this partition plan that was approved, Resolution, Resolution 181. Okay? What I'm trying to show you is, is it's been this progression. Okay? There's been this progression of the bones that are rattling, the bones that are starting to take sh shape. Okay? They're starting to take form. Okay? Does that make sense? Then what happens? In May 14th, 1948, you have what we actually saw, the declaration of the state of Israel. They became a country on May 14th, 1948. That's when I believe the bones came together. Ezekiel 37, I believe, partially came to fruition. Now, many, many theologians will communicate Ezekiel 37 has all come to fruition. I don't, I don't take that stance, and very rarely do I communicate that type of you know, line, but I want to show you why we believe that. But in May 14th, 1948, you have the declaration of the state of Israel. Now, May 15th, the next day, began the war of uh, independence for Israel. And that war lasted from May until the end of January of 49. But then in January 25th, 1949, you have Israel had their first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion. Okay, hence you have an airport named after the first prime minister. Why are we saying that? Because some of you, all of us, we get to participate in experiencing 70 plus years of when this actually took place. So the prophet Ezekiel said all of these bones are going to come together. Now, I'm going to show you. Remember, there's a shell, but the scripture says what? There's no what in them? There's no breath. Ray? I just don't want to skip past the obvious that the first prime minister's name was David. Yeah. David, that's good. Uh, here's what I want to say, though. So now you have bones. Bones to me, okay, that's fine. It's Israel 1948, but where are the people? Right? So what does that look like? Now, here's what's, this is just crazy. Um, I'm going to go through some history on here. Bear with me as this sounds uh, like very historical, and it, it really is. But as of, uh, do you know that when Israel in 48, when this took place, okay, there was historically a little over 5 million Jews worldwide. So in 1948, there was Jews everywhere, okay, 5 million of them, but only 650,000 were in the land at the time. Okay, you with me? 650,000 were with them at that time. So you got 5 million plus. Well, now, let's, let's move ahead. Now, over the course of time, what does Israel do about 
bringing the bones. Well, I'm going to give you a couple examples. In 1950, okay, two years after they became an independence, they had this thing called Operation Alibaba. Operation Alibaba was this. They brought in from a specifically um, Iraq, they brought in 113,000 Jews and brought them to their land. Why is that so important? Do you remember the scriptures talk about how they're going to come from their land? The bones are going to start taking uh, shape and form, but there's no breath in them. Okay, that's one of them. There's another one. Operation, you got to love these names, Magic Carpet. <laughs> so you got Alibaba and Magic Carpet. Somebody like Disney. Okay, I don't know. Uh, in September of 1950, 47,000 folks from Yemen were brought to Israel. 47,000. Do you remember the bones, right? They're coming, it's taking shape, but there's still no breath in them. But it's there. Now, interesting enough, in 1984, they switched. They went a little bit more biblical. Operation Moses. You went from Alibaba to Moses. <laughs> and then you have 7,000 Jews that came from Ethiopia. Now, the one I really want to just unpack just a little bit, because I think this is so important to see practically, Israel is pursuing the prophecy. Israel is practically pursuing. So now this one is, is more of my favorite. Uh, you have Operation Solomon. May 14th, 19, uh, May 24th, sorry, 1991. Ethiopia was experiencing a civil war. And so what they asked was all of the, the Israelis in Israel, the, the Jews, they asked any Ethiopian Jews to cross over the desert to get to Addis Ababa. And so they're basically saying, hey, Ethiopians, if you're Jewish and you want out of this civil war and you want to come to your motherland, we're coming to get you. This one will mess with me. That's crazy. So these Jews had to cross all over the desert to meet in Addis Ababa. And Operation Solomon meant that they're going to bring 34 Air Force planes, 34 total of El Al jets. And in the middle of all of this, they brought all these soldiers from the IDF and they put them in plain clothes. And these plain clothes soldiers helped all of these Ethiopian Jews get on 34 planes, 14,000 of them. And said, we're bringing you home. And so what do you see is that you see this, this form taking place in Israel. The Jews are actually coming back to the land. Now today, what does that look like? You have 14 million Jews today. Okay, that's as, as of 2020, okay? 14 million Jews. Now in Israel, as of 2020, roughly there's 6.7 million Jews in the motherland right now. 6.7. Now how many Jews are there worldwide? 14. So you've got a big gap there, right? So 45% of the Jewish population is back in their land. They're here. 45%. Okay, so there's some things just prophetically, I think, that got to keep happening. In Israel, the government is playing a huge part in this. Our friends that are there, they have this ministry called Aliyah, Globi Aliyah, and they're bringing the Jews back into the motherland. It's a biblical thing, but there's no breath in them. 5.2 that live in the land were born in Israel. So they were born there. A million of them are from Europe or America. 293 are predominantly from Africa and 164,000 are from Asia. I'm trying to show to you guys, they're coming from all over. Okay? This is a part of the fulfillment of Ezekiel 37. There is, the, the bones have come together. That you have the skin and the flesh is coming together. But in verse 9, it says, uh, in verse 8, there was no breath in them. They are not, this is going to sound really drastic, alive. In verse 9, so here's what he says. God says to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 37, verse 9, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, say to it, this is what the Lord God says, breathe, Come from the four winds and breathe into these slain so that they may live. 
That four winds language, Ray, what's that language? Where do we go with that? Yes, yeah, so that for me ties into um, just God calling the, all of the Jews back to Israel. It's coming from the, the four corners of the earth, if you will, and that there is a draw the Holy Spirit does before anyone comes to faith. You know, there's this stirring and a draw of the Holy Spirit. And I believe this stirring and drawing all of the Jews to come back into the land is what this is speaking to. There's a, there's a breath from the four corners before the breath that brings about the full restoration of Israel. That's right. He wants them all back in the land. Does, uh, that, make, does that, everybody clear in that? He's bringing them there so what? He can breathe into them. He's going to breathe into them. Uh, and that breathing into him, let's just call it out, is what? It's salvation. It's, it it's the Holy Spirit. It's, it's Jesus after his resurrection breathing into the disciples. So he's bringing them all to the land <laughs> so that they can experience the salvation. Now, is it true that a Jewish person can experience the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and not live in Israel? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the church was birthed mainly from the Jewish people. And then throughout history, you know, Messianic Jews or Jews that believe in Jesus, but there's never been a corporate acceptance or receiving of him. That's the key. That's what's coming. We're talking today about the rebirth of Israel corporately, the ultimate revival that's going to take place. So everybody, this is just kind of a picture and image that you have. Let's go back to our little drawing here. Okay. Uh, this is our friend Israel. Okay. Okay, this is Israel. Israel was formed in 48. Now, in this process, now watch it, it says, this is so fun, I love this text. In verse 10, it says, so I prophesied as he commanded me. So I did it. I did what God asked me to do. And the breath entered them and they came to life and stood on their feet a vast army. Now, some people would say, well, that's just the formation of Israel. We believe it actually has a lot to do with more of what we would call after the return of Christ. And then we believe we are now entering into the period that's called the millennium. Okay? So here you have this process. They've taken a form, but right now, what Ezekiel is going to prophesy, he's going to prophesy something that's going to take place here. He says this in verse 11. I'm going to come back to some of this, okay? Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Look how they say our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are cut off. In other words, it doesn't look like we got any hope. Therefore prophesy to them and say, this is what the Lord God says. I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. My people and lead you into the land of Israel. You guys, this is going to get swirly. Remember the deep well? He's prophesying, I'm going to bring you up from your graves and bring you where? To the land. This has not been fulfilled yet. That's how I know Ezekiel 37 is not just for 1948. This language of corporate resurrection has not taken place yet. Just keep drinking, okay, from a deep well, okay? This is a little bit thicker here, okay? Now watch this, this open grave language. He says... Uh, uh, I'm going to open up your graves and bring you up from them. He's talking about bringing people back to life. You know that, right? In Matthew 27, here's a little taste of this. Matthew 27, 52 through 53. Matthew 27, 52 through 53, it says this. It says the tombs, remember, Christ has come back to life. Do you remember this? And then it says at that point, the tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had gone to their rest were raised. And then they came out of their tombs after his resurrection. And then they entered the holy city. And they appeared to many. Who are these people? You know, there's these many saints. The next thing you know, Christ comes back to life and he decides to bring a couple with him. You got any idea, Ray, who these people are? It, I don't believe it was a resurrection from the dead. I, bl I believe it was a revival from the dead similar to Lazarus. So those people obviously died, they didn't have their resurrection body. and Because we don't know how long they were here on earth. We don't know if they went back and they died. We just know that they experienced death to life. Okay? So that's a picture of this. Now, ultimately, the open the graves language is rapture language. 
First Thessalonians, finally, you're like, somebody finally is talking about rapture. Finally, amen, right? First Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11, okay? It says, about those times and the seasons, brothers, you do not need anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. It says, when they say peace and security, then sudden destruction comes on them, like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in the dark for this day to overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then we must not sleep. Uh, we must not sleep like the rest, but we must stay awake and be sober. For those who sleep, Sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, we must be sober, okay? And put on the armor of faith and love on our chests and put on a helmet of the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, dying, if you're dead or alive, we will together be with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. So, if you're going to use language here, okay, I'm going to do a couple things in here, okay? I'm going to write this in here because we've talked about this a little bit already. Here you have God's wrath. Okay, here you have Satan's wrath. Again, if you want to know more about this, you can go back to some other lessons. Okay, and then in this process, you have what's called the rapture. The graves are going to open up, okay? That is anybody that has faith in Christ, that's been dead, is now going to meet up with God in the air, right? Yeah. And when they meet in the air, what about their bodies and their spirits? Explain that quickly. Yeah, it talks about being changed in the twinkling of an eye. At that point, we receive a resurrected body. So those who are alive get it instantly, and they actually follow those who are dead in Christ uh, get, they actually come up out of the grave, receive their resurrection body, and then those who are alive are caught up together with them in the clouds in there to meet Jesus in the air. Okay, so the dead in Christ come first. Hebrews 11 says this is who some of them could be. Okay, I'm just going to recite just a couple of the names, otherwise I just, uh, uh, you've got Abel, first martyr in the Bible. How about Enoch coming up in the air? How about Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua? Can you imagine the dead in Christ, the graves opening up because of their faith in Christ, meeting up in the air with maybe some of us if we're alive, depending on the time of where you land. Don't get caught up in that though, please. Just know that the dead in Christ are going to come up. They're going to meet up with those that are alive in these Old Testament saints the Rahabs, the Gideons, the Baraks, the Samsons, the Jephthahs, the Davids, the Samuels, maybe the Hezekiahs, the woman of Zarephath, maybe Jeremiah, Zechariah, like the dead and saints that have faith are going to, the graves is going to be opened up and come hang out with us in, with Christ. I'm saying that for a reason, because individually they have faith in Christ. And so we're not talking about corporate revival here. We're talking about individual, those that know Christ. Does that make sense? So when I say the term rebirth of Israel, I'm talking all of Israel. That's what Ezekiel is talking about. That's why Ezekiel is talking here, not here. Ezekiel is not talking rapture language. Ezekiel is talking millennium language right before it begins. Okay, now watch. Hang in here with me. You guys are, thank you. You're doing great. Scripture then continues, okay, in all of this. Okay, let's go back, Kevin, if we can. Ezekiel 37, verse 12. I just want to read it again. He says, this is what the Lord God says. I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them, my people, and I'm going to lead you into the land of Israel. So in this, we know that the millennium takes place where? In the land. And that land looks like this. You're going to come in, and you're going to be come into this land once the Spirit of God is there, in that language, Ray, let's go there. Zechariah, Joel, you want to go there? Yeah, this, um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, Pentecost, when Peter was explaining what was happening, he quoted Joel too, that in the last days, the guy was going to pour out his, all, his spirit on all flesh. And he talked about sons and daughters prophesying, old men dreaming dreams, young men seeing visions. And he talked about, on uh, the servant and the master, what he's saying is everybody is going to receive 
And what happened on Pentecost is a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in the nation of Israel. And Zechariah talks about it. Um, and this is going to be a massive repentance for not receiving Je Jesus in his first coming. And it's going to be a recognition and a cry for him now right. as all the armies are coming against Israel. So the Zechariah 12 language of them realizing who Christ is, is the same language, you guys, as Matthew 23, verse 39. It's that same language, Kevin, if you'll go there. So when the Jews are right here and they begin to see Christ, the Matthew 23, 39 mentality, for I tell you, you will never see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When the Jewish people begin to corporately cry out and say who he is, that's what integrates the return of Christ and initiates the thousand year reign. Now, the part that I want to go there that's like, how do they know? Because there's 144,000 Jewish evangelist witnesses that are going to be testifying to the Jews during the wrath of God. They will be going out, advancing the kingdom of God, saying, guys, this is who Christ is. This is who the Messiah is. Oh, yeah, we're going there. Why not? And so this is the reality, you guys. So you have to say, why are they saying that? Because they're talking about the Lord in the end times. And it's the Jews that are going to be doing that. That, to me, it doesn't get any better than that. Finally, they're going to realize who they are and who Christ is. And then God says, good, I got a lot of room for you, Jewish people, and Gentiles as well. Both the Jews and the Gentiles will have a home in the millennium. Ray, you want to address any of that at all? Um, God is always reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Even in the midst of his wrath, he's calling Jew and Gentile to faith in him. And that's the beautiful part about the, the sealing of these is, uh, this is kind of crazy, that the rapture and resurrection happen and they're believers. They have, a, they have an assignment to stay behind, walk through wrath without being harmed. I get, man, it's messing me up. Uh, and they're, they're leading the whole nation into a corporate repentance for the return of Jesus. So the evangelists will have a seal to set the tone, to release the word, so the Jews can see who he is. And then here you have, and it says this in Ezekiel, Kevin, can you go to verse 30, uh, 37, verse 14? Uh, it says, I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and you will settle in your own land. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. I have spoken and will do it. This is the declaration of the Lord. I will fulfill my word. I love what one commentator, Alexander, says. Is what you see here is the rebirth of Israel, is that you see the people, the land, and the government all coming together. King Jesus rules and reigns. Isaiah 66, 7 through 9. Please write this down. Isaiah 66, 7 through 9. It says, before Zion was in labor, she gave birth. Before she was in pain, she delivered a boy. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in one day? <laughs> or a nation be delivered in an instant? Yet, as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her sons. Will I bring a baby to the point of birth and not deliver it? Says the Lord. Or will I who deliver... Close the womb, says your God. In other words, I will start what I finish. I will finish what I start. That's the language that he uses. And he puts all of this into one day. Now, a day to the Lord is so different <laughs> than us. That's the point I want to show. Ray? You know, even thinking about uh, the buildup during Desert Storm, it took nine months, you know, for the armies to assemble. So this is real stuff. We have no idea how long wrath lasts. And there's a buildup of troops that are going to go against Israel. So this is a process. Yeah. Even, even, I believe, the breathing uh, of, the, of God's outpouring. I don't think the whole nation, all of a sudden, one day, they all wake up and they believe in Jesus. Yeah. It's a process. The more it's like popcorn, one, one gets it, another one gets it. And we all carry spiritual atmospheres. And I think that atmosphere of faith starts a whirlwind 
-hmm. of revival, just like you see real world revivals throughout human history, it starts in one place and then a fire starts. And it just keeps building until a crescendo of the whole nation is recognizing Mm -hmm. who Jesus is and they're crying out. But it happens over time. So this might sound and look like a bad, funny visual, but I just want to show you this. So now all of a sudden, Israel's back. They're back into the land, right? The difference between this person and this person, it's they have the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. They came on them and in them. They now believe in Yeshua as their Messiah. And the one thing I want to point out, just to wrap all of this up, and I believe the Lord can allow me to do this, in Ezekiel 37, 15, and through the rest of the text, you guys, Ezekiel 37, 15 through 28, you see a story about two sticks. And what you see is he's supposed to prophesy that one of the sticks is a stick of Judah. One of the sticks is a stick of Joseph. And he said, no longer are these sticks two, they're one. Why is that important? Because you have to remember at this time of prophecy, Okay, at this time of prophecy, they were divided. So now he's saying, as you come into the millennium, as you come into this period of filled with breath, filled with life, by the way, I'm going to combine Israel and Judah and they're going to become one. That's really, really important. And oh, by the way, the scripture says prophetically, as they are one, I want you to see verse 34, uh, 24, my servant David will be king over them. So in this, in this, you now have, in the millennium, you guys, you have what? One Israel. And in one Israel, you have very clearly King Jesus overall. Ray? You know, we've seen repeatedly God doing a dress rehearsal or a foretaste or just a prophetic glimpse and he talks about, you know, that in, in language of Jesus coming from the line of David, you know, that King David will sit on the throne. He's talking about Jesus. I still go back to what we talked about at the beginning, that the first prime minister name is David. Yeah. I think it's a, a wink from God yeah. prophetically That's right. about what's going to happen. Amen. So here you have a much bigger picture. Hopefully you see this now from reading Ezekiel 37. I want to just close very simply with verse 28. It says in Ezekiel 37, 28, when my sanctuary is among them, the nations will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel. Everything will be on Israel. And all of the nations will know. And I love this because... (laughs) By the way, after the thousand year reign, next week, what do we get into? It's called Gog and Magog. If you aren't familiar with that, it's called Armageddon. I wrote that funny. It, well, here's, here, <laughs> I just opened a can of worms, didn't I, right, for people that they don't know. I did, didn't I? That's all right, I'll go there. That will. Watch, here's, here's, there's two battles. That's what I meant to do. There's Gog and Magog and Gog and Magog. Yeah. Now you're like, what? <laughs> yes. Anything else? I mean, that's really the reality. You see a battle here, and you will see a battle here. This is uh, Ezekiel 37. Uh, David, more than welcome to come on up, please. This is, a, this is a lot. This is a deep well. And I thank you for drinking from it today. And uh, yeah, I couldn't be more honored and humbled just to walk through this text. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would just speak to our hearts in this time. <laughs> uh, may we just see what you want us to see in the end times. Get your people ready. Bring them to your land. Get them ready for King Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.